get some insights on the news shaping the markets. I feel like we're all just what will happen this week. David Bonson's with us, Chief Investment Officer at the Bonson Group. Good morning. Well, good morning. So we remember past elections. We remember big overnight sell-offs. Are, are you expecting volatility? And would you say those sell-offs are buying opportunities? It would depend how sustained they are. I do think that you could get volatility if there's uncertainty. And this is a hard part is that we don't know if we're going to know a winner or not on Tuesday right, night. Right. And, and let's say a few states are very, very close. It doesn't mean we won't know a winner because if, if six or seven of the states are all going to one candidate or the other, two or three being hyper close won't necessarily matter. So a lot of it will just depend on the way the market is pricing in electoral college. Um, I, I expect there will have be volatility overnight action, which is sort of irrelevant. Wednesday morning, I go back and forth. I think we may not know a winner. We may. Either way, what we do know is we're going to end up with a winner, whether it's two hours, two days, or two weeks. Right. And look, sometimes they have to recount the ballots in particular counties. That might take time. Um, but the question is, what would make you say, yes, this is a buying opportunity? Because the people that bought... Um, I remember when Trump was elected the first time, we had overnight selling of about 1,000 points on the Dow. The people that were buying right on those dips did very well. Um, as far as we know, there was a grand total of one person doing that. It was Carl Icahn, uh, and it lasted about an hour at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so you're right. That was a major sell-off that lasted uh, till four hours before the market opened. People didn't right. have a chance to buy it. Right. That was based on an inaccurate feeling that the Trump winning was going to make markets drop. This time, if there's volatility, it'll be based on sketchiness, skittishness around uncertainty, not necessarily an outcome. So I don't think it's the same exact thing that um, markets would be selling right. off because of one candidate or another winning or losing. How about the Congress? I mean, because that's no. such a big part of it, right? A lot of folks almost are hoping for, uh, you know, um, gridlock, and, gridlock, lean yeah. duck, whatever you want to call it, right? Because that might be ideal or not necessarily? Well, look, I think that um, the way I've described it for clients, when you talk about capital gain taxes going up or regulation going up or some of these other issues, if the baseline case, meaning the worst case, is a Republican Senate with Kamala Harris as president, I don't believe markets are going to react that negatively. If there was a scenario where the Democrats were going to hold the Senate, which is almost impossible mathematically, mm -hmm. West Virginia is a goner, and then Montana looks extremely likely. Now, the Republicans may not get 52 or 53 Senate seats, but they're very likely going to get 51. So she can't raise capital gain taxes with 51 Republican senators. That takes a lot of market skittishness off the table. All right. So what do you like? Um, is there anything that you say works for the next six months, 12 months well, in a I, portfolio? I think it's very important in the way we manage money. If I only like something for six months, I don't want to buy it because right. we think a lot of things go wrong in six months. Right. So our thesis okay. need to be, have a little more staying power. Um, look, tactically, because everyone's talking about the election, uh, electric vehicle mandates are going to go up if Harris wins and down if Trump wins. Liquefied natural gas terminals are going to go up if Trump wins and down if Harris wins. Uh, bank regulation is probably going to go up if Harris wins, down if Trump wins. Those are election-sensitive themes, but we want to know that the dividends are growing of companies we're buying, no matter who's president. Uh, I, because I'm pretty confident gridlock's the worst-case scenario, then we're willing to buy all the things we'd be buying anyways. In other words, politics is probably the fourth or fifth most important thing to yeah. us right now. And you like financials, right? We do, but not yeah. necessarily the big banks. We own J.P. Morgan, have owned it 15 years and made a fortune on it. But we like asset managers. We like fee-based businesses that don't have a Such ton of as. balance sheet risk. Blackstone. Apollo and Blue Owl Capital are three that we own. We've done very well with. Molis is a very boutique investment bank that we own, and we think M&A is coming back big, and uh, Molis is a, a name that we've owned for a couple of years now. Yeah. What about some of the other sectors that people seem to be hot on? Utilities, healthcare? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Healthcare means different things to different people. We own a few pharma companies. Yeah. We don't own managed insurance care. Uh, but on the utility side, we only own one name, and it sold off quite a bit last week, but it's up big on the year. There's just no question that it, the story is true, that if data centers are going to come right. online in this country, they need a lot more power. So we own American Electric Power. It's up over 25% on the year, but definitely still in a position to grow further. But we don't over-own the sector. What was your interpretation of the jobs 
12,000 uh, on Friday. I know we talked about Boeing and the hurricanes. Um, what did you make of it? Any honest person, that's all they'd be talking about because it, 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 the number is going to get thrown out the month before got thrown out. You had two. The worst part of Friday was not 12,000 in October. It was July and August being revised yes. down 100,000. Right. And so there is just a lumpiness that for years now, we automatically look at three-month rolling averages because month by month we assume that there's going to be all yeah. kinds of correction up and down. Yeah, and the concern, because you did, you made the point about uh, Friday, right, the, the revisions, um, and that was a big deal there, 112,000 jobs yeah. lost for September and August uh, put together, and 12,000 came in on Friday. Um, but here's the thing, is that the anticipation for 100,000 jobs or whatever was with the hurricanes and Boeing in mind. Was it a great miss for some reason? Like, how could, I mean, was the whole country, you know, under a hurricane? I think people were surprised that they got it so wrong. Yeah, I am not surprised because it's almost impossible to do in a country of 330 million people and 160 million in the labor force. If people yeah. want something to view as negative long term, it's that the labor force itself keeps shrinking. So yeah. you, you're right, there were only 12,000 jobs, but the unemployment rate didn't move. How does that math work? How do you keep 4.1%? Because 220,000 people left the labor force. Uh, we're in a very big risk of building more factories, getting more manufacturing, getting more onshoring, and not having any laborers to do it. That's the problem I see longer term. As far as how they measure it month by month, they didn't miss it if those people end up replying to the yeah. survey by next month and it right. gets revised upwards. Right. I'd probably bet on that. I'd like to talk about the tariffs, but I'm going to leave that because, you know, it just seems uncertain at this moment, right? It's a lot of talk. What is for real, and that is the Fed meeting, yeah. is coming up. Um, that's coming up real fast. Some of your thoughts there. What do you think the Fed should do, may do? Well, it's a 100% chance they're going to cut rates a quarter yeah, point. They're right. not going to leave them, and they're not going to cut half a point. They're going to cut a quarter. It's something closer to 80% that they cut a quarter point in December, so that's not quite as certain. Um, look, this is a tricky deal because people think I'm criticizing the Fed when I say this. It has nothing to do with jobs. It has nothing to do with GDP. It has nothing to do with the Atlanta tracker. It has nothing to do with inflation. They have to cut because they know that there is over a trillion dollars of commercial real estate loans resetting their rate in the next year. There's over a trillion dollars of corporate debt resetting in the 18 months after that. And at the end of the day, the Fed really got lucky that they tightened so much, but the very few people were paying the higher rates. So the Fed has to get that lower, not to mention our own government is far in debt, overly indebted. So there is a 26 percent of federal debt that will reset. They want the rate lower. David Bonson, the Bonson Group, great to see you. Thank you, David, for being here.